Max, uh, everybody's talking about AI and uh, the ethics of AI. And as we look to the future, we can already see not, um, uh, not hypothetically what happens when we introduce uh, AI into human brains, but it's already happening. Cochlear implants, if you really understand it, is a remarkable um, uh, um, technology that uh, recreates hearing for many people who've lost it. It's a simple level. It's a few thousand maybe data uh, uh, electronic uh, components as opposed to billions, but nonetheless, it's, it's a beginning. So project forward. You've been thinking a lot about this in terms of AI, but as you look to the future, what are, what are some, what are the trends today? Where could they lead? I think it's pretty clear that artificial intelligence and the quest for ever more intelligent non-biological minds is going to ultimately become the best thing ever to happen to humanity or the worst thing ever to happen to humanity. And that's why it's just so motivating okay. to think about these questions now and think about what concretely we can do to make it good. Because everything I love about civilization, you know, from the ability to build gigantic water pumps to everything else it is the product of, of human intelligence, right? So if we can amplify our intelligence with either various kinds of upgrades to our brains or pure artificial intelligence outside our bodies, then we can use that extra intelligence boost to tackle all of the toughest challenges that we're stumped by in today's society and create a future where really life can flourish like never before. No, not just for the next election cycle, but for billions of years. And not just on this planet, but throughout much of this amazing cosmos. Uh, so what, what, what will happen? Uh, what, do you, what do you see? I mean, we, we, we talk about the thought experiment of replacing one neuron with a, with a, uh, a super dense um, um, uh, uh, chip that uh, could have uh, multiple billions of uh, transistors within it. Uh, at, at the scale, uh, we're nowhere near the capabilities of, of, uh, of, uh, of chips right now. So you can replace one and then we can say replacing or adding, just keeping what you have and adding. Yeah. I mean, wh what, what conceivably could that result in? I mean, there's a lot of fascinating work on obviously happening right now on neural implants and neural lace and brain electronic interfaces, which I think can be very, very valuable, not just for people with handicaps, but um, maybe for all of us. But I, I also do think it's going to turn out in the long run to be easier to build human level intelligence completely from scratch than it's going to be to understand exactly how our brain works. You know, just like it would turn out to be much easier to build an airplane <laughs> than to build a mechanical bird. Right, right. And um, when you came, when you flew here, you you probably didn't go in a mechanical bird, even though finally, 100 years later, there's a TED talk now where you, you can see one. You know, basically because when um, Darwinian evolution develops something like flight or, or intelligence, it's constrained to uh, be incredibly energy efficient, which you don't care about if you're an engineer, and it's constrained to only use the most common atoms in the periodic table that are abundant in nature which we again don't care about as an engineer. And it's most importantly constrained by only making things that can self-assemble <laughs> and self-repair, which our laptops cannot, right? As an engineer, instead you prefer simplicity, which evolution doesn't care about. So this poses this very tough moral question and existential question. If we can make machines that are very different from us, that can do everything cheaper and more intelligently than us, what, would, what do we want the role of humans to be in this world? Uh, and I, I think this is that's actually the most important question of our time, because we're racing towards that without talking about it much. So many people have, they have this very passive attitude of complacency. Ah, let's just build these machines which can make all humans obsolete, not worry about the consequences, you know, what could possibly go wrong. Whereas I would like us to be more ambitious and envision a really inspiring high-tech future where that we would be excited to live in and then figure out how to, how to steer there.
I think this is very much lacking in the public debate where all we can ever do when we talk about AI is instead think about nightmare scenarios. Every single Hollywood movie basically <laughs> about the future is a dystopia. What, uh, what about the ethical questions? Are, are there some? We have increasing ethical issues with animals, research on animals, animal consciousness. Um, people, more and more people are uh, vegetarians. A friend of mine said he would never eat anything that has a face. Um, so are there eth ethical questions that could, um, that could emerge in, in, in AI as it becomes more human-like and even transhuman? There are many ethical questions. First, there are ethical questions about what AI does to humans, and then there's questions about what we humans do to the AI. So for the first kind, we can ask ourselves, do we really want AI to manipulate people like Cambridge Analytica? Do we want AI to create ever larger income inequality because the people who do the work get replaced by machines? So now the money that went in salaries goes to the capital owners. Do we want to use AI to build lethal autonomous weapons that can be used to anonymously. So far, it's doing people. all of those things. <laughs> but there's an increasingly vigorous debate in society about where exactly do we draw the line between the beneficial, between what we want to do with AI and what we don't. And I'm hopeful that we can make some progress here because biology succeeded greatly in, in drawing a line, saying, okay, we're not going to do bioweapons, mm -hmm. we're not going to mess with the human germ line. And as a result, biotech is a great boon to the world now. And so that's the whole business about what AI is doing to us, where we simply need to draw that line. Uh, what about what we do to AI? If, as you said, one day we have artificial minds, which can also be conscious and maybe experience suffering or positive emotion. You don't, you, don't, you don't know that's possible. We don't know uh, whether that's possible or not, but I think it, it's carbon chauvinism to just take as an axiom to say that you can only have subjective experience if you're made of carbon mm -hmm. atoms or meat or whatever. Uh, and I, I think we have to, I mean, Churchill said we only, the only thing we learn from history is that we don't learn from history. Mm -hmm. But I hope we can learn from history on this one because we have done exactly that mistake with slavery where we said, oh, they don't feel pain or whatever, or, or women don't have souls or mm -hmm. animals don't feel pain. I was even told as recently as five years ago that it's okay to boil live lobsters before you eat them because it's proven that they don't feel pain. I guess someone asked them. <laughs> and then they, now there's research showing that they do feel pain and they banned lobster boiling in Switzerland. Yeah. So let's not make that mistake again with machine, with or intelligence. With, or everybody pretty much in AI today, again, just takes as an item of truth, as an axiom that their machines can never suffer, and they have no qualms about turning them off, yet they're trying to build ever more sophisticated ones and with the attitude that they're going to use them as slaves. And uh, I hope this time we can actually get it right and, and study the question of what information processing is conscious to ensure that uh, if AI does succeed in its ultimate quest to make machines that can do everything we can do, not only will we deploy them so that there is more human happiness and less human suffering, but to also make sure that we don't create a bunch of new forms of, of digital suffering.